Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Intracellular Therapies Conference Call announcing the top line results from Study 402. At this time, all participant lines are in listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone, and if you require any further assistance, please press star 0. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. I'd like to turn the conference over to your host, Dr. Juan Sanchez, Vice President, Corporate Communications and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's conference call, um, announcing the positive tolerance results from Study 402, our study evaluating lumatacron as an adjunctive therapy in patients with bipolar depression. <clears throat> our press release announcing the results crossed the world a short time ago and is available on our website. Joining me on the call today are Dr. Sharon Mates, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Andrew Saplan, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Suresh Dorgam, Senior Vice President of Late Stage Clinical Development and Medical Affairs, and Michael Holstead, Executive Vice President and General Counsel. In addition, we are very pleased to be joined on the call today by Dr. Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto and Head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit at the University Health Network in Toronto. Dr. McIntyre is a consultant to intracellular therapies. He has received research grant support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research Global Alliance of Chronic Diseases and National Natural Research Foundation of China, and he's a speaker, and he has received speaking and consultation fees from Lombeck, Janssen, Purdue, Pfizer, Otsuka, Allergan, Takeda, Neurocrine, Sunovium, Minerva, and Intracellular Therapies, and also Abby. Dr. Roger McIntyre is a shareholder and CEO of Champignon. As a reminder, during today's call, we will be making certain forward-looking statements. These statements might include statements regarding, among other things, the efficacy, safety, and intended utilization of the company's product development candidates, our clinical and non-clinical plans, our plans to present or report additional data, the anticipated conduct and results of ongoing and future clinical trials, plans regarding regulatory filings, future research and development, our plans and expectations regarding the commercialization of Caplita, the potential impact of the COVID pandemic on our business, and possible uses of existing cash and investment resources. These forward-looking statements are based on current information, assumptions, and expectations that are subject to change and involve a number of risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from those contained in the forward-looking statements. These and other risks are described in our periodic filings made with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including our quarterly and annual reports. We caution not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements, and the company disclaims any obligations to update such statements. I will now turn the call over to Sharon. Thanks, Juan. We're very pleased to be here today to share the positive results from Study 402, our Global Phase 3 study evaluating lumetepron as an adjunctive therapy in patients with bipolar depression. Lumetepirone 42 milligrams met the primary endpoint in this study with significant improvement of depression compared to placebo. This study also confirmed the favorable safety profile of lumetepirone that has been demonstrated in our prior bipolar depression and schizophrenia studies. These results, in conjunction with the robust results from study 404 reported last year, provide replicate and robust support for the benefit of lumetepirone in treating bipolar depression. These studies will form the basis of our Supplemental New Drug Application, or SNDA, for the treatment of bipolar depression in the patient populations included in studies 402 and 404, which were patients with bipolar 1 or 2 disorder treated as monotherapy or as adjunctive therapy to lithium or valproate. We expect to submit this application to the FDA in late 2020 or early 2021. We are excited about the potential for label expansion of lumetepirone into a second major indication and to advance the treatment of patients suffering from bipolar depression. 
The positive results presented today also continue to support the potential for benefit and additional indications we are pursuing, including major depressive disorder and other mood disorders. Let me share the details of study 402. The study was conducted in five countries, including the U.S., and enrolled 529 patients. Eligible patients were between 18 to 75 years of age with a clinical diagnosis of bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 disorder who were experiencing a current episode of moderate to severe major depression and had a Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale, or MADRAS, total score greater than or equal to 20 and a clinical global impression scale depression score of greater than or equal to 4. Patients must have been maintained at adequate blood levels of lithium or valproate as mood stabilizers for at least four weeks prior to receiving adjunctive lumetepirone. Patients were randomized to receive lumetepirone 42 milligrams, 28 milligrams, or placebo once daily in the evening for six weeks with all three arms continuing to receive lithium or valproate. The primary endpoint was changed from baseline on the MADRAS total score at week six. Now to the results. Baseline characteristics were evenly distributed among the treatment groups with a mean MADRAS total score of 32. Lumetepiron 42 milligrams met the primary endpoint with statistically significant greater improvement over placebo on the MADRAS at week six. In the intent to treat population, the LS mean improvement from baseline for lumetepiron 42 milligrams was 16.9 points versus 14.5 points for placebo for a 2.4 point difference between the two groups. These results, which represent a clinically important difference, yielded an effect size of 0.27 and a p-value of 0.0206. Lumetepiron 42 milligrams also met the key secondary endpoint of statistically significant improvement <clears throat> on the clinical global impression scale for bipolar depression with a p-value of 0.0082 and an effect size of 0.31. Lumetepiron 28 milligrams showed a non-statistically significant trend for a dose-related improvement in symptoms of depression Though not formally tested against placebo since it did not separate on the primary endpoint, lumetepiron 28 milligrams demonstrated a statistically significant improvement versus placebo on the CGI. The lumetepiron bipolar depression studies were powered for the overall patient population and not powered for subpopulation analysis. In spite of this, statistically significant benefit versus placebo was seen in the subgroup of patients with bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 in study 404 and in patients with bipolar 1 disorder in study 402. While the bipolar 2 subgroup was not statistically significant in study 402, when the overall outcome of the study is positive, the indication granted by the FDA typically applies to the entire sample, including subpopulations, as illustrated in the seroquel bipolar depression indication. In this study, lumetepiron also demonstrated a favorable tolerability and safety profile consistent with findings in all our previous bipolar depression and schizophrenia studies. The most commonly reported adverse events, defined as a rate greater than or equal to 5% and at least twice the rate of placebo, were somnolence, dizziness, and nausea. Importantly, the rates of akathisia, restlessness, and extrapyramidal symptoms were low and similar to placebo. These findings, together with the lack of metabolic effects, including weight gain, seen in the schizophrenia and previous bipolar depression trials, differentiate lumetepiron from other available treatments, including the few that are approved in bipolar depression, and offer the potential for helping a broader patient population with a well-tolerated treatment option. We will be presenting additional results from this study at future medical conferences. We are joined on the call today by Dr. Roger McIntyre, who will share his impressions of the 402 phase three results and his views about our program in bipolar depression. Dr. McIntyre, uh, please share your thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Sharon, and good morning, everybody. Bipolar one and bipolar two disorder are highly prevalent psychiatric conditions affecting approximately six million adult Americans. 
These are chronic and debilitating conditions with an increased risk of suicide and are reported as some of the most costly mental disorders in the United States. These disorders are characterized by recurrent episodes of mania or hypomania, interspersed with episodes of major depressive episodes. Bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 each represent about half of the overall population of patients with bipolar disorder, with bipolar depression being the most common clinical presentation and is the principal reason affected persons utilize healthcare resources. Depressive episodes tend to last longer, are more difficult to treat, recur more often, are associated with suicide, and are also observed to have a worse prognosis than manic or hypomanic episodes. The results of study 402 presented today provide clear evidence of the efficacy of lumetepirone 42 milligrams for the treatment of bipolar depression in a population insufficiently maintained on either lithium or valparate. Together with the company's positive study 404 results previously reported in bipolar depression as monotherapy, lumetepirone now has the potential to be the only approved treatment for bipolar depression in patients with either bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 disorder as an adjunctive mood stabilizers or as monotherapy. The benefit of lumetepirone as a broad treatment for bipolar depression is further enhanced by its favorable safety and tolerability profile. This overall efficacy and safety for lumetepirone is especially relevant for practicing psychiatrists because of the increasing awareness of the high prevalence of bipolar 2 disorder and the unequivocal evidence that mood stabilizers, especially lithium, have benefit as maintenance therapy for many patients. International expert opinion regards lithium as the gold standard mood stabilizer in bipolar disorder, inviting the need for efficacious and safe treatments combined with lithium when lithium is insufficient on its own. To fully appreciate the potential for lumetepirone in patients with bipolar depression, I would point to the current treatment landscape. There are only a few approved treatments for major depressive episodes in bipolar 1 disorder, and only one of them is approved for bipolar 2 disorder as monotherapy. There is also only one treatment currently approved for adjunctive use. These treatments are often associated with toler tolerability issues, such as weight gain and movement disturbances, Results from the Depressive and Bipolar Support Alliance, the DBSA, which is the largest advocacy group in the USA for persons with a life lived with bipolar disorder, identify weight gain as the most common reason to discontinue medication. Taken together, the efficacy and tolerability of lumetepirone reported in the monotherapy trial and now replicated in the adjunctive trial has the potential to fill an important unmet need in the treatment of adults with bipolar depression. Bipolar 2 disorder patients are often underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed as hypomanic episodes are not as severe as manic episodes. As a result, individuals with bipolar 2 disorder are more likely to be treated with medications such as antidepressants that are unproven and do not have FDA regulatory approval in bipolar depression. The availability of more drugs that have shown to be safe and effective in this large patient population would greatly help in disease recognition and improve patient outcome. I want to commend intracellular therapies for evaluating lumetepirone as an adjunctive treatment in bipolar depression. Adjunctive studies can be challenging as patients are already being treated with a mood stabilizer but not being adequately maintained. Lumetepirone 42 milligrams was able to show statistically significant improvement in this difficult to treat patient population. This positive result is reinforced by the results seen in the CGI, the key secondary endpoint in the study, which closely resembles what practicing clinicians observe in their daily practice. Achieving this with a remarkable safety and tolerability profile is fantastic. From my perspective, these results combined with study 404, provide evidence that lumetepirone 42 milligram is effective in a broad range of patients with bipolar depression receiving different treatment regimens. Congratulations to the intracellular team. I will now turn the call back to Sharon. 
Thanks, Roger, for sharing your perspective. We are proud of today's results. The team will be working diligently on preparing the SNDA submission, and we look forward to the day when we can offer patients with bipolar depression the option of lumetepron. Operator, we can now open the call for questions, please. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. And to withdraw your question, just press the pound key. Our first question comes from the line of Charles Duncan from Cantor Fitzgerald. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Sharon and team. Uh, congratulations on these uh, very nice results. Um, had a quick question on the NDA timing. Um, I know that it's probably tough to pin down, but do you need to meet with the uh, uh, agency before you file the SNDA, and are there any additional clinical, um, I guess, data or, or preclinical data that would enable that? Can you give us a sense of the uh, rate limiting steps to the SNDA timing? Um, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, this is Sharon, and thank you. And hi, Charles, and thank you for the congratulations. We are very pleased here. Um, as, as we've said, uh, we are preparing our SNDA, um, and we uh, will be filing that as fast as we can, which is late this year or early next year. Um, we have all we need um, uh, you know, to put together our package. Um, and, um, you know, a package is composed of, of a lot of different um, uh, clinical trials as well as um, uh, other information, and so everything is ongoing for the uh, submission late this year, early next year. Okay, that's very helpful. And if I could ask a follow-up question for Dr. Uh, McIntyre. Um, Dr. McIntyre, thank you for sharing your perspectives. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, take a look at the effect sizes that were um, that were reported, as well as the patient sample, uh, including I think it was a baseline mean madras of 32. What's your perspective on the clinical utility of the drug? I know that there are very few. Uh, options uh, for these patients, but what do you think about the effect size and then also call it the, the sample in terms of being representative of a broader population of patients? I appreciate your questions. First of all, the uh, effect sizes are highly clinically significant for me as a clinician, but also when I think about benchmarking effect sizes, not just to medicine broadly, but also to the options that are available. So the effect sizes that Sharon called out, uh, not just with the primary outcome, but also the secondary outcome, are highly clinically significant. What's also especially relevant, and you touched on this, is that these are individuals whose MADRA score was, on average, about 32 at the baseline. This would be very representative of individuals who have depression, who are utilizing services not just in primary care, but a variety of other settings, including but not limited to specialty care settings. In other words, this is a modal patient. This is a composite of a patient that would be commonly encountered, especially given the fact that they've not been sufficiently responsive to either lithium or valparate. What's especially important about this sample composition is that it includes individuals with bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder. We've learned from epidemiologic studies conducted during the past two decades that bipolar II disorder is as common as bipolar I disorder, and in some studies it might be slightly more common. Notwithstanding some of the slight differences in epidemiology, what we do know is that both of these subpopulations are commonly encountered, and they're, they're not well served by the existing treatments. And as you touched on, there are only uh, a few FDA-approved treatments for adults with bipolar depression, and this would be the first time that we have in the field of psychiatry a treatment with replicated evidence of efficacy as monotherapy and as an adjunct in a full sample uh, set that includes bipolar one and bipolar two. So it's extremely relevant given its representativeness of not just the patient population, but the unmet needs that currently exist. Very helpful. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Final question for Sharon or Andy. 
uh, in terms of even uh, further broadening the potential utility of uh, lumateprone. You mentioned um, activities in major depression disorder. I'm wondering if you could give us an update or a plan for uh, forward for MDD, given these results. Um, I can start. Andy can chime in. Um, uh, we are planning our studies for uh, MDD, and we do expect to uh, uh, start in the clinic later this year um, for MDD. Okay. Very Andy, good. did you Congrats want to add anything? Results. Andy? Yeah, no, 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 that's the plan. And uh, just that, um, you know, these results obviously give us uh, increasing confidence about the uh, um, potential for this drug in depressive disorders of all types. So, uh, you know, it's been accumulating from the schizophrenia program on, uh, and now we're uh, quite, a, quite a bit further along with that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Brian Abrahams from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, it's uh, Leah one for Brian, uh, and congratulations on the data again. Um, and so I have a, a question. Now, I, I know it's challenging to compare across um, different studies, um, but I, I was just curious if um, you could provide some additional color on, in, the, um, in this current study, the placebo-adjusted rate was um, 2.4, but in the prior monotherapy study, it was um, 4.6. Is this just due to the adjunctive versus monotherapy differences, or do you see any effects in either baseline characteristics or subpopulations that could account for this? And are there any factors um, among these that you could see leading to either greater or lower real-world efficacy? So uh, let's ask uh, Dr. McIntyre to take that, please. Sure. Thank you, uh, Leo, for your, your questions. And it's... Um, certainly very pertinent to understanding the clinical translation and ultimately the, the acceptability of these results. Again, it goes back to something I mentioned earlier. It's highly clinically significant that we have these findings as represented by the effect size. When we think about effect sizes that are observed in the area of bipolar disorder broadly, but more narrowly in bipolar depression, an observation which is highly replicated is that when an agent is studied against placebo in the context of monotherapy, the effect sizes would be expected and they are higher than what is observed in adjunctive clinical studies. These are complex uh, illnesses in the sense that there's multi-dimensions of psychopathology. And frankly, when it comes down to uh, uh, evaluating any intervention, it's always been the case that it's been more difficult to show a p-value of significance with a new agent when there's already an existing agent that's been prescribed. And in this case, it was either lithium, which is a gold standard, or valparate. So with, in fact, the precedent being almost without exception that monotherapy is superior to adjunctive treatment as expressed by effect sizes or between group differences on the primary outcome, we expected that going into this, and that's exactly what was seen herein. Moreover, the only other uh, agent that we have that's been FDA-approved for bipolar depression, which was studied as a monotherapy and as an adjunctive treatment, that being Latuda, the Razadone, also, in keeping with the um, uh, evidence in this area, showed a higher effect size as monotherapy than it did as an adjunct. Moreover, the effect sizes that were observed with lorazidone in adjunct were very similar to the effect sizes that were observed herein. So key differences, however, are that this program, that is the lumateperone program, in contradistinction to the lorazidone program, included adults with both bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder. The lorazidone program was delimited to bipolar 1 disorder. Moreover, despite the fact that lorazidone is without clinically significant weight gain and metabolic change, 
In this case, lumetaparone is, a, is also not showing significant weight gain and unlike lorazodone, is not showing extrapyramidal symptoms or movement disorders, which is observed with, with lorazodone. So taken together, when we think about the effect sizes, these are what we would expect. These are clinically relevant. When we compare to the precedent, it's in keeping with the precedent. And the effect size of efficacy needs to be alongside the effect size on tolerability and with lumetepirone, we are seeing, in fact, no difficulties with respect to weight and metabolism, and unlike lorazodone, there's no uh, movement disorders observed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes to the line of Umar Rafat from Evercore ISI. You may proceed. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for taking my question, and congratulations again. Um, I, I guess two questions, if I may, and one perhaps for background for everybody listening in. Um, Sharon, could you remind us what percentage was bipolar 2 um, as a percentage ITT in this trial and, um, and your expectations on um, both bipolar 1 and 2? And I asked that question in the context of some of the observations you may already have across your clinical program, perhaps not just this one trial alone. Um, and secondly, if you could speak to placebo response, um, and again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm not sure I got uh, everything you said. I'm, I'm sorry. I was distracted for a minute. Um, can you ask your question sir. again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I was just asking about the I was just asking about the uh, bipolar 2 um, uh, subgroup oh, in the Oh, right, trial. the percentage is in, in the study, right. Um, right. So it, in it, study 404, it, we sure. had about 20% of the patients with bipolar 2. In this study, um, it was a few percent lower, and we will be describing all of that at, at a later time. Got it. That and was Karen, the just first to be clear, one. Okay. Given the percentage, given the small percentage of bipolar 2 in this trial, as we think about the um, possibility of bipolar 2 on label, um, is it fair to assume that the data will probably be pooled across studies just to start to form the basis of whether there's a real trend? Um, uh, no, I, I think I'll ask either, I'll ask Andy uh, to, to take that question. Um, to start and then maybe for um, Dr. McIntyre to fill in afterwards. Yeah, so uh, Umar, uh, it's Andy Silent. Thanks for the thanks for the question. Um, the key thing to keep in mind is that uh, FDA typically gives an indication for the population that you've studied, and they look at each study individually. In both of our studies, we have patients with both bipolar one and bipolar two disorder, and both studies overall are. Um, positive and statistically significant, and as Dr. McIntyre has indicated, uh, with results that are highly clinically meaningful. Um, so, uh, no, we're not anticipating that there's going to be a need to do any kind of uh, pooling, as, uh, as you suggested. Um, the studies stand on their own. Uh, as I said, both of them include both pop subpopulations. Um, and as Sharon had mentioned in her, uh, when she presented the results of the study, um, even though uh, subgroups are, we, we never power for subgroups, uh, but we, some of the subgroups uh, have been statistically significant in both of these trials. Um, we think the data that we have overall are certainly uh, adequate for getting the indication for both subgroups. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll also respond, Omar, uh, just to pick up on um, what you've asked regarding the placebo response. Uh, wasn't um, entirely clear as to the specifics of your question, but as a more, more general reply, indeed, as you know, placebo response rates in psychiatry are noted by FDA to be considerable, and there is a trajectory uh, wherein that the last two decades, the placebo response in psychiatry broadly, certainly including bipolar and mood disorders, has been increasing uh, for a host of reasons. Um, we were reminded, for example, recently a very large randomized controlled trial development program with Brexpreprazole in mania 
failed to separate from placebo, again, to the, uh, uh, in both studies, uh, and it was observed that there was fairly significant placebo response rates. And, and so that failure to separate from placebo with Brexpiprazole in mania was really a cautionary reminder of how high placebo response rates are. Whenever a company conducts a study in bipolar, this is always a concern. And what was especially relevant to highlight uh, in this program is that this program included adults who have bipolar II disorder. And as well, as Sharon had articulated, there were three separate arms. There was placebo and two separate drug doses. One of the observations we've had in psychiatry is that when there are three arms rather than two arms, in other words, placebo versus a single dose of investigational agent, multiple arms increase placebo responses. We also know the placebo responses may be higher in people in adjunctive paradigms. Taken together, this sample composition represents what we would typically see in clinical practice, that is bipolar one, bipolar two. These are individuals insufficiently treated with lit lithium or valparate. And from an investigational perspective, there were factors within this trial design, that is, factors including multiple treatment arms that FDA has identified as increasing placebo responses. Notwithstanding all of that, this full analysis set, the full sample, which includes the subpopulations, when treated with lumetaparone at 42 milligrams, demonstrated superiority of statistical and clinical significance over placebo. For me, when I first saw these data, that for me was the zinger. In other words, that's what was the key part. These were clinically relevant data, a safety profile relevant to patients from the data from the DBSA in a context of a disease state with a very high placebo response rate. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Mark Goodman from SVB Link. You may begin. Yes, morning. Um, just curious about your interactions with FDA previously with respect to the indication of will you get both adjunctive you know, and mono, uh, given that you've done one study. I was curious if, if you've had that conversation. If it's good enough, you, you feel confident in that. Um, and then the second question has to do with just COVID and just given everything that's been going on the past six months, I was curious if you had to make any adjustments to the study, and if so, um, how did you account for those adjustments and, and how much of an impact do you think it may have had? Thanks. Great. Andy, do you want to um, start that, and maybe I can pick up where you leave off? Yeah, sure, happy to. So thanks, uh, thanks for the questions. Yeah, well, so uh, first, with regard to adjunctive and uh, monotherapy, yes, we have, uh, we believe and we have indication from FDA that we'll be able to get the indication for uh, both of those indications for uh, were based on two positive studies overall and one positive study in each population. Um, with regard to the COVID, um, I mean, I think the key thing here is overall, uh, you know, the data we presented are the full ITT. The overall study was positive uh, with a statistically significant result. Uh, we will be looking um, for the, you know, benefit of our uh, learning going forward uh, about whether there's been an effect of uh, or what there, uh, what possible effect there might have been of uh, COVID-19 with regard to this trial, but uh, the results speak for themselves. Um, we did allow during the course of the study uh, that if uh, in, in line with the uh, FDA guidance that they put out regarding um, modifications of uh, a trial, in, including uh, remote assessment, uh, we did make those things available flexibly to the sites that were still participating in the trial uh, after COVID-19 had started. What we found was that um, not much of that needed to be employed. Uh, in other words, most of the patients continued to be seen as they were in the, in the earlier parts of the trial at the clinic uh, visits. Uh, again, you know, uh, we will be looking at the um, data with regard to before and after COVID-19, but that's not something we've done yet, and it doesn't certainly doesn't seem to have affected uh, the overall results. Thanks. Great. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> All right.
right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, please limit yourself to one question. Our next question will come from the line of Jessica Fye from J.P. Morgan. You may begin. Hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, if I'm limiting it to one, um, I'll just ask a question for the management team. What's the status of study, I think it's 403, and do you still plan to run that trial out to completion given it no longer needs? Uh, no longer appears to be needed for approval. So thanks for the question, Jennifer, and hi. Um, so, you know, we are, uh, we did, we just got the 402 data. <laughs> We've just analyzed it. We um, are presenting that data today. We will be looking um, into um, our plans and we'll evaluate our plans and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Matt Kaplan from Leidenberg Thelman. Please proceed. Hi, good morning and congrats on the results. Um, Jeff, can you give us a little bit more detail in terms of uh, the profile of the patients with respect to weight gain in the study? What did you see? Any differences than, than prior studies? Um, Andy, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yep. Uh, we did not see any weight gain in any of the treatment groups in this study. It was, it was, keep in mind, it's a six-week study, but in any, in any case, there was no evidence for any weight gain um, across all the treatment groups. So, and it was, was placebo-like lack of change, basically. Got it. Thank you, and congrats on the results. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Bert Hazlitt from BTIG. You may begin. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'd love for Dr. Um, McIntyre to elaborate a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind, on the, um, the importance of the CGI result that was seen here. Uh, and then I'm just going to try to sneak in a yes or no second question. Is the 42 milligram dose now the dose that we should consider for other indications going forward? But Dr. McIntyre, uh, could you just comment a little bit more on the, the CGI result and the importance for the practic practicing physician? Thank you. Thanks, Bert, for your question. Maybe for the second part of the question, as that may pertain more to the company's to strategic thinking, I'll maybe leave that to Andy or Sharon or other people from the company. Um, I really love your question, Bert. In fact, when I first saw the results, the reflex of the academic in me is to look at the MADRA score, because that's the primary outcome. Sharon presented it. We had a p-value that was significant and a sex size clinically relevant. But the clinician in me was looking at the CGI because the CGI gives us a gestalt, an overall portrait of the patient. And effectively, that's your proxy of the clinical relevance. And the CGI that was presented, the results that were presented, presented as a, an effect size, were highly clinically relevant. In fact, also observed in bipolar 2. So for me, the CGI really resonates from the clinical perspective, because that's the patient taken together. Clearly, the primary outcome was the madras, and that's also important, but I have an additional, if not even more, sort of interest in the global improvement of the patient. So for me, that was really the um, empirical evidence supporting my hunch that this was going to be clinically relevant. I'll maybe pass the second question on to uh, someone from the company. Andy? Yeah, I, I think you correctly pointed out we've uh, demonstrated efficacy for 42 milligrams now in schizophrenia and bipolar depression. Um, we haven't finalized all the plans for the design, uh, all aspects of the designs of uh, uh, future trials, but you can certainly expect that 42 milligrams will be one of the doses, if not the dose that we will use. Thank you, and congrats. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Jason Butler from JMP Securities. You may begin. Hi, thanks for taking the question, and let me add my congratulations also. Uh, just another question for Dalton McIntyre. Uh, can you just maybe give us a little bit more of a sense of um, the, the patients that you treat now, what percentage of them do not respond adequately to valproate or lithium? And when you think about the, the both the approved and the off-label options you have today, 
how you'd think about, you know, when and in whom you'd use lumetepirone when approved in, in the indication. Thanks. Thanks, Jason, for your question. Uh, indeed, clinical impression that I have after 25 years of treating adults who are affected by bipolar disorder would in many ways be in accordance with the published literature on valparate in uh, lithium, uh, and that is is that the majority, uh, majority meaning uh, closer to 65 70% of people who have bipolar depression, type 1, type 2, who receive lithium or valparate despite adequate dosing and adequate blood levels, continue to be affected by symptoms that are sufficiently severe to reduce their quality of life and function, so about 70%, so the great majority. And um, with respect to lumetemporone and where I would see it fitting in, well, there's a two-part answer to that. I'm an author of many guidelines, uh, not just in the United States. I led the, the Florida Medicaid guidelines uh, for bipolar and major depression. But also, I'm an author on the International Society for Bipolar Disorders guidelines, um, which are uh, updated uh, every two to four years. In, in a guideline, the evidence base supporting uh, lumetepirone would make it a first-line treatment in the adult with bipolar depression broadly and would include specific call-out for bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. As you know, there are reimbursement markets that are uh, affected by different jurisdictions, and that's a, uh, you know, that'll be affected by these more uh, structural factors, and, and I'll maybe leave it to the company if they want to comment on that. But from the science based on the unmet need and where this would be positioned in an evidence-based, expert-prepared guideline, lumetemporone would be a first-line agent. I also want to emphasize strongly that in addition to having insufficient control of symptoms, most of the existing therapies for bipolar cause very significant weight gain. That not only is an adverse event that leads to treatment discontinuation, but it is identified by this population, that is people with bipolar, as the number one reason they do not want to take these medications. By the way, the second reason is movement disorders. So lumetaparone doesn't just deliver with respect to the therapeutic effect, addressing this incredible unmet need, but also does it in a way that doesn't leave the affected person with side effects that they rank as the most important side effects for not wanting to take the medication. So you can see why that calculus of efficacy and tolerability would result in this agent, lumetaparone, being a first-line agent in the adult with bipolar depression. With respect to any of the companies and their comments related to your other part of your question. That's great. Thank you very much for taking the questions, and congrats again. You. Thank you. Operator, I think we have time for one more call, uh, one more question if there is. Um, All right. Our last question will come from the line of Andrew Sai from Jeffries. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, and congratulations. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So um, I guess my question is a big picture question. Uh, um, I'm just curious. I mean, does today's data give you a better explanation uh, of why the prior monotherapy was mixed? Uh, by no means am I dismissing the data. Just curious if there was a clearer explanation after today's results. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. I'm not. I'm not sure um, uh, of the exact nature of your question, but are you are you asking why we we have study 404, the last study um, that uh, read out, which was extremely robustly positive. Um, are you talking about study 401? Um, we yeah. did have one study, study 401, that was not positive. And we did have a very high placebo effect in that study. So uh, we do have a greater understanding of the potential reasons behind that trial failure now. Um, uh, and we do think that um, the study itself did offer very valuable information. Uh, to remind you, the safety profile in that study was the same as the safety profile in all of our other studies. And in, in fact, we will be reporting 
on further information from that study as well and further meetings. Um, uh, Andy, do you want to add anything? And, and by the way, just uh, again, we have confirmatory evidence from study 404, which was very robustly positive as a monotherapy study with a, a very robust effect size. And as, um, you know, uh, we were saying before, uh, a CGI as well that was uh, very robustly positive. Andy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, I think I would just add that, um, you know, I think uh, we have said before that we did a thorough, uh, detailed uh, analysis of the study 401 uh, results and that based on that, uh, we remain confident that the design and the uh, conduct of study 402 uh, was proceeding in a way that uh, we felt comfortable with and I think uh, that's been borne out. Uh, now we've got the positive result from study 402. Um, and yes, it does help uh, our further learning, uh, but you know, fortunately, uh, it, it turned out that we were correct in terms of our, um, right. it, you know, lack of concern based on the 401 results. Very true. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the explanation. Very great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure any further questions at this time. Great. I'd like to turn the call back over to Dr. Makes. Want any closing remarks? Great. Great. Thank you, operator. And thank you, everybody, for joining the call this morning. We are really excited about uh, the results and, uh, um, and about the progress in our company. So thanks very much. And operator, you may now disconnect the call. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.